Thanks, Jason. Thanks, everybody. Uh, last talk of the day, so uh, you know we'll get we'll get through this, and we'll get to beers. I'm psyched for that. Um, and uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Facebook's product infrastructure today, um, and I'll tell you a little bit about what that even is because it's kind of a made-up thing. Uh, but by way of introduction, you know, I joined Facebook uh, a little over five years ago, five and a half now actually, and uh, I joined after my startup, uh, which was called ShareGrove, pretty much failed. You know, I managed to sell it to Facebook, but um, you know, I did a lot of things wrong with this startup. And, and part of what I want to tell you about today is kind of some of the things I've learned that I that I did wrong. I didn't know at the time by working at Facebook, and things that I've learned about product development. I think of myself mostly as as a product developer, even though now my role is mostly as a manager of this team called Product Infrastructure. And uh, Facebook Product Infrastructure is responsible for some of these open source technologies that you may have heard of. Uh, I just put a few of them up here, React. I think a lot of people have heard of. Flux uh, is this architectural pattern that um, has been referenced a few times at this conference. You can look it up. Um, GraphQL is something very new that uh, we put out there that we use internally. Um, product infrastructure is also responsible for some lower level stuff. Um, you may have seen the, uh, the JavaScript typing library flow. Um, we uh, have worked on like the internal application layer, which we write in a variant of PHP we call hack. Um, there's some low level mobile infrastructure, and then a lot of the UI, sort of centralized UI component work happens on product infrastructure as well. And I'm not going to tell you too much about um, those technologies today. Because I know not everybody works on mobile, and not everybody works on the front end, and not everybody here even considers themselves a product developer, I would guess. You know, a lot of back end people here. Instead, what I want to tell you about today is the environment at Facebook, especially the product development environment, and why product infrastructure kind of works at Facebook, and, and sort of the counterpoint that it provides against like, the very effective mainline product development track at Facebook. And uh, I, you know, at, at the end of that, uh, after I describe a lot about how, how product works, I want to talk a little bit about infrastructure and what I think that is. And it gets a little weird from that point on. So I hope you'll come with me on, on kind of a journey here. Um, but let's start with things that we know uh, and, and talk a little bit about what software products are. And you know, there's all kinds of software products and products that use software. But in this case, I'm talking mostly about you know, kind of this, someone uh, mostly sitting at their computer or especially uh, sitting on their phone and interacting with something that's like pretty much a user interface. Like that's really what we're trying to deliver, right? Is is a satisfying user experience in the form of of a fluid user interface that kind of meets people's expectations. Um, so you know, this is what I think of when I think of a product. Uh, but you might think of of the product you're working on. And I would argue, you know, and and this is certainly a point of view. But even if you work for a bank or you work for Uber or whatever. A lot of what you're doing is really trying to present a user interface, you know, and there may be multiple users. And I think actually that kind of typifies a product, right? Like a product is often not just the one end user, the consumer. Um, there are other users. At Facebook, you know, a really important user is the advertisers who are trying to reach the people who are browsing their newsfeed. Um, but then there are a bunch of other users that sort of exist in this constellation. Uh, that you know we don't always think about, but they're uh, important parts of the product as well. We've got like operations. So you know, um, Dave was talking about all the people who need to understand how the product is working in production. That's something else that typifies a product, right? Um, and we also have a business because someone's got to figure out how to make this thing make money and, and get us paid. Um, so you know, there's there's more than one user, and this is an ecosystem. Uh, with requirements kind of at every level that are very hard to express that overlap in ways that we really have trouble predicting. Uh, the other thing that I think is interesting about a product is that um, you know, with infrastructure, like we, we kind of want to build it. And actually, whether we want it to or not, it lives forever, right? Like, you know, a lot of the infrastructure we use today, whether we like it or not, you know, it was kind of built in the 70s. And, and what we have is either a, uh, an evolution of that or some kind of reaction to it. Um, uh, unlike that, products actually are expected to undergo this life cycle. Now, I would argue that over the last, this is kind of old school, this product life cycle thing. This is anyone know crossing the chasm from like the 90s? But anyway, um, what we've tried to do, I think, is actually like skip the whole introduction thing, right? That's lean startup. Um, and no one even wants to bother with maturity and decline. Forget that. You just kind of sell your startup or whatever. 
and growth is kind of the, the big thing that we focus on now. And, and you know, that's good. Uh, maturity and decline is kind of depressing. Um, so, you know, and I, most of what I'm going to talk about when I talk about product development is really talking about this growth phase because uh, the way I think about it is like once you put something, you know, on your AWS server, you should immediately start using it, you know, just, just within your company or just within your friends or depending on what the product is. Like you want to get to that point where you're kind of thinking of it as production as soon as possible. So how do we develop a great product? And, um, you know, this is the thing, this is the part where I'm going to tell you kind of what I think I've learned at Facebook. Um, if you'd asked me this five and a half years ago when I was working at ShareGrove, I'd say, like, you do an extensive user-centered design phase, or you hire great designers, or you spend a lot of time, like, writing out sticky notes and putting them on the wall or something like that. Um, and, you know, I actually think that that's completely wrong. I, I, I really don't think there's a lot of value in that. Now, that's not to say that there isn't value in design. Obviously, you have to think about what you're doing. The more deeply you understand like, what the requirements are and who your users are, the better off you'll be. Um, but at the same time, I think there's really only one way to build a great product, and that is to iterate on it. You have to sort of build it as quickly as you can and then see if it works and then make changes. And that's the reason why Facebook has a lot of these kinds of mantras on the wall. Um, and, you know, I think this is really misunderstood, and I'm going to try to explain to you how I see uh, what some of these slogans mean. So, move fast and break things. I think people think that means that we're talking about uh, being sloppy or, you know, just, hey, copy the code from here and paste it there and push it. Um, that does happen a lot. I don't, I don't want to pretend that it doesn't. And, you know, I think it's a price we pay for, you know, I, you probably know, like, it's very hard to control how people will react to any corporate message you put out there. Um, but, uh, but the way, here's how I see this. The first thing is that I'll say, at this point, you know, Facebook has like a billion users every day. So if you are afraid of that, you could easily be paralyzed by that, right? Like, how could you even ever make a change to Facebook? You know, it's like, are you kidding me? There's, there's too many people, too much traffic. It's going to break. So one thing you have to believe is that you know, even though you just graduated from college and you probably don't know that much about distributed systems, you can write a diff and push it and uh, not fear the consequences. And so what this really means is that most of our engineering work should go towards making it so that you can't break it, not, so that, not to make sure that you don't break it. And by emphasizing that, you get this velocity, which is, which is what we're looking for. And so. Um, this is how I would typify the process at Facebook. Um, I call it hacker process, and it's pretty simple because hackers don't like a lot of process. Uh, so uh, first thing you have to do is you have to build it. And you, know, you just do, don't mess around with this. Just write the damn code. And you know, if you're in a long brainstorming session where you're arguing about which features to build first, just agree on one feature and build it, and ship it as fast as you can, and then build the next feature and ship that. That's, you know. At, th there's like no better process than that. Now, once you build it and ship it, your goal is to increase sort of audience. And you can do that with, by like increasing engagement of your audience or by increasing the number of people who use your product. And these things are usually mutually reinforcing. Now, there's another thing about hackers that I think most people really don't get, you know, like, which is that you know, do hackers just like to kind of build stuff and stick it out there and then go on to the next thing? You know, yes, sure. But the reason why is because they've solved the problem, not because they just have like kind of done something crappy and moved on, right? Like that, I think, is the essence of hacking, which is to find it maybe a sometimes surprising way of solving a problem. Now, in production software, especially like user software like this, there's not an obvious way to know if you've solved the problem unless you do careful measurement. So one thing about this hacker process that I really have to emphasize is that you have to do careful measurement. And oftentimes, you'll put as much time or more effort into building your metrics and understanding the behavior of your feature or your app in production as you do into building it in the first place. This is a real part of the hacker process. And like, no true hacker would be satisfied with like, push and pray, because that, you don't know if you solve the problem. And that's ultimately what you're trying to do. Um, and I've tried to illustrate like, what, what we're trying to do here with a little animation I made. This is my keynote directorial skills. Um, so you know, what we're going to try to do is like, have these really short iterations where we're exploring what I would call this conceptual landscape, which I've tried to represent with this topological map. 
And what you can see is that if we keep the iterations short and we don't go too far, we can kind of map out this conceptual landscape and we can kind of walk to the top of this peak. And this happens a lot at Facebook and it's a surprisingly effective way to improve on things. You know, making 1% improvements day over day, week over week, yields huge gains year over year. And I think, you know, if, if sort of, especially Facebook in its web era, if it did one thing really well, it was this. You know, it was sort of early on understanding that, like, you don't just push once a week, you push every day and multiple times a day. And if we could do continuous deployment, we definitely would. Um, so having said that, you know, uh, what seems obvious here is that, like, the faster we can climb this hill, the better we'll have a, a better product, and sorry, the sooner we'll have a better product, and then we can go on from there. So how can we improve iteration speed? Like, what are some engineering things we could do to enable this iterative process? Um, and when I say that, you know, I think there's some bad trade-offs we could make to improve iteration speed. I, I pulled up this example because, you know, for a long time when I joined Facebook, Facebook's mobile apps were a very thin wrapper around a mobile website. Do, do people remember that kind of a little bit? OK, yeah, I see a few hands. And you know, this was great for Facebook, right? Like we could do what we did really well, which is push the website frequently. And you know, if we made a mistake, we could fix it quickly. All that don't move fast. You know, what would you do if you weren't afraid is push everything all the time. Uh, so that was great. You know, unfortunately for users, it was not as good. Um, and uh, you know, I think a lot of ink has been spilled over this particular sort of change in direction. And also, I think since this time, a lot of people have shown that you absolutely can write a performant mobile web app. The question I would ask is, like, is it worth it? You know, I, I think what we've seen at Facebook is that it's actually a little easier to maintain a couple or a few separate implementations uh, on the native platforms to make something that's performant and feels really good and can grow. Um, so the question we need to ask is not just how we can improve iteration speed. It's how we can do that without giving away too much in terms of end user quality. And I use the word performance here. I could have just as easily said efficiency. Um, but I didn't want to get, get into like developer efficiency and that kind of weirdness. So for the most part, especially on mobile, efficiency is performance, although there are times we can give away efficiency and get performance. Um, OK, so what can we do to do this? Um, now I'll tell you what I think is actually the secret weapon that Facebook has. And, and I would say that if you take one thing away from this talk, this part is the part I want you to take away, because I think you can go back and implement this right away if you haven't done it. Uh, Facebook release engineering. So there are no feature development branches at Facebook. There's a cut every week. It goes whether you like it or not. Um, you always commit to master. The culture is you know, write the smallest if you can and commit it. Um, and you know, your code is going to go out every week. Once you commit it, you can't take it back. And then uh, we cut the release branch. Then we can pick some changes into that release branch. Hopefully, just fixes. But usually, especially if you bribe the pushers with whiskey, you know, you can get a couple logging changes into into the release. Um, and then you let it sit there for a couple days. Right at the end, make sure you don't have any bad crashes, and you ship it. This is a mobile development schedule. For web, uh, it moves a little faster. We cut it every week, and then you can ship updates a few times a day. Um, this is pretty different from the whole microservices thing that you've heard a bunch about. I'm not sure I buy into the microservices thing. I'm happy to talk to anyone about that. I don't have a presentation on that, but it's, it's pretty different, right? Facebook actually has moved towards uh, big monolithic re re repositories, um, and we're trying hard to consolidate even further uh, because we think that the advantages for code sharing are, are really high. Um, now, this has been presented before. If you haven't ever heard of this or seen it, Check it out. Go look at like, uh, some of the videos we have for Facebook release engineering. And you know, this release process will be explained in more detail. What I don't think we've done a great job of explaining is like, how this actually can work. Because I, you know, I tell people about this, and they're like, wait a second. If we just like, took master every weekend and just tried to ship it, that would be a total cluster. Like That would never work. Um, so there's, there's something else here that for developers that makes this possible. And this is runtime code gating. Uh, or and experimentation. And when I describe this to people, I think some people think I'm talking about like something like Optimizely. Do you guys know what that thing is? Where you can like A-B test 
different. OK, no one, no one here is an optimizely user. OK, I see someone there. All right, good. So you know, people use experimentation to like test different kinds of copy or different colors for buttons or something like that. That is not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about actually protecting almost every new feature development with a runtime gate. And I just want to kind of illustrate how this works for you. And unfortunately, you know, I'm going to present this. You're going to be like, wow, this sounds cool. Could I have it in open source? We don't have this in open source. You'll see why. It touches a lot of systems. It's something you kind of have to implement yourself, at least for now. But I can explain the concept. You could go do it. This is the first thing I'd do if I had another startup. So sorry, this is going to be PHP code. I think this might be the only slide in this whole conference with PHP code on it. I don't know. Um, we have this free function here. It's called GK check. That's for gatekeeper. And I've named my experiment 64-bit rollout because you know 64-bit all the things. And what I've done is actually, it used to just say init here. But now I say, OK, if we're in the experiment 64-bit rollout, call my new routine, and you know, we'll take it from there. And now I can write total garbage in init 64, commit it to master, and it can go out in, into production, and it's fine. It doesn't matter. In fact, depending on the release configuration, it might even get stripped back out because of guards or whatever. But um, actually, that's not entirely true, because it really is a runtime check. There are ways I could turn it off. But, um, I'll get back to the effect this has on our app size in a sec. That's undesirable. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, you know, now I'm free to develop my thing, and you know, I'm, I'm happy. I can write code and, and commit it to master. My friends can code review it. No complicated feature development branches. OK, the next thing I have is I have a web console that controls how this experiment will work in production. And um, you can see we've got a bunch of choices in, in the dropdown. Uh, this is actually slightly old. Um, because it was already on the web, I didn't have to argue with anybody about whether I could show it to you guys. Um, and you know, at this point, with this tool, you can target like left-handed people in Venezuela who don't eat meat. Um, but uh, but for the most part, you use a few basic restraints with this tool. You know, one thing is like I want to I want to pass for this, right? Like I'm testing this feature. Another one is it's hooked up to our internal Teams tool, so I can say everyone on my team sees this feature. Uh, I can say a certain percentage of employees see this feature, and that has a stable salt. So you know, release to release, week over week, that'll be the same cohort of people. Um, and then you know, finally, I, ca I can push it to a country. That's sometimes important if I have a feature with high network effects. Or I can push it to some percentage of production users, often a very small one since there are so many. And that's a really good thing about working at Facebook is you can turn on exposure logging for like 0.01% of people for an hour, and you'll have a more data than you know what to do with. Um, so that's awesome. I <laughs> love that. Uh, and you know, it's great that we also dog food this stuff. So people go home and use this. You know, on my team, they'll give me feedback. Um, but this way, now I can, you know, I, again, I ship my feature already. It's in the release. Now I can turn it on. And invariably, I did something wrong um, because you know, that's, that's why I'm a manager now. Um, <laughs> but uh, I can turn it right back off again. You know, and, and I can segment my logs this way, I, whatever. It's a, you know, it's, it's a completely separate code path. Last thing, this is really important. This goes back to that measurement thing, which is um, now I need to know how people, how my metrics, how this changes my metrics. How, what does this experiment do to the things we care about? So now um, this is another web page, a different tool that we have, which will tell me uh, how people in my experiment do on key metrics for the company. And these metrics can be defined by any group. They're kind of categorized. At this point, there's like way too many, and people are like, what does sessions underscore v2 Tuesday mean? You know, but anyway, you know how that goes. Um, but, but the idea is that like, I've got some top line metrics that I really care about. And the, other, the reason why I wanted to make sure I showed this to you and not just tell you about it is that this has error bars on it. Even with all the samples that we get, it's really important. Like, what, what happened when we first built this tool is that we were completely paralyzed. Because you know, almost anything you do to change something is going to tank some important metrics. Like, because you have all these other systems that are optimized around the current implementation. So at some point, you just kind of have to hold your nose and say, this is good enough. I'm going to ship it. And then I know that we'll be able to, to take it from there and like, kind of optimize everything else around it. So you want to be able to see these error bars and understand whether you have a statistically significant change in your metric or it's kind of in the noise. Um, but uh, I cannot recommend this approach highly enough. And you know, as I said, like, this is the one thing that I would really change about how I do any product development in the future is 
measure really carefully, runtime gating, do not mess around with release branches or any kind of, if you have a release schedule where someone can delay it, they'll delay it. That is guaranteed to happen, right? Like the release date can only go in one direction, which is a bad one. So don't let that happen. Just ship it every week or every day or continuous release. If, if you can do that, you're my hero. Okay. So I show this to people and they're like, okay, this, you know, I see some of the advantages. That sounds good. And I already alluded to this. But like, doesn't that mean that everyone just adds code and no one ever cleans anything up? And uh, I could say a bunch of things about this, but you know, the basic answer to that question is yes. That, that's pretty much exactly what happens. Um, and uh, this is uh, what someone externally did. They took our iOS binary and decompiled it and found that it has 18,000 classes in it. Um, and there are some really embarrassing <laughs> class names in there. Uh, you know, and I'm not. Look, I'm going to tell you a bunch of things about what Facebook does. And uh, I think people um, certainly have misunderstood the thinking that I'm saying, like, the, I'm proud of this, or this is like the one true way, or something like that. My argument is that this is effective. And it's, I kind of wish it weren't true, like, right? I wish that I could say, stand here and say, like, look, software architecture is the most important thing, having the best, most efficient implementation is the most important thing. But that has really not been my experience. My experience has been that this kind of iterative development is actually how you create this value because you really don't know what's going to work and what's not going to work. So yes, we end up with a ton of classes in our app. And you know, this causes problems, right? Like it, it certainly uh, bumps, bumps us up against limits in the app stores. Um, it causes problems uh, for our application tier in terms of simply just pushing all the code we have. Um, so what do we do about this, right? Like, so one thing we could do is we could say, OK, guys, stop changing things, we're going to refactor. Um, and that would, be really, that would be really bad for our business. And periodically, someone is, you know, actually, there are always multiple teams at Facebook working on rewriting Facebook. It's not possible. It just, you know, there's no way that you can even capture all the requirements of Facebook. Um, so you know, I think it's still worthwhile to, to try, because you find out important things. And actually, um, usually what you identify is like, OK, we can't rewrite Facebook, but we could rewrite this system and make this sort of improvement, but there's still this tide that like, you know, kind of crap, tidal wave of crap, like kind of that's not possible to hold back. So actually, where do you invest your engineering, right? If you, if you kind of know that this is your destiny, like entropic growth, what do you do? Well, this is the part that's kind of crazy, but kind of cool. You take all these really smart people that you have, and instead of like changing your architecture so that it's perfect, you ask them to make it so that you can continue to scale even when it seems like you shouldn't. And um, this is this example which uh, sort of achieved some notoriety, I think, which was, um, I, I probably won't do it justice. I'm not much of an Android programmer. But basically, uh, Android Gingerbread and earlier has this like memory buffer in it, uh, which is limited to, to five megs. Okay, So you can only have five megs worth of active uh, method symbols like at a time. And you know, you'd think that would be enough methods, probably, five megs worth. Uh, but even before we shipped our rewrite, you know, we, we were moving away from this mobile app. And we, we already had an Android app that was too big to run on Dalvik because of this uh, data structure. It's called the linear alloc buffer. Um, so, and this is one example. There are a lot of these. And they're all kind of crazy, but they're all kind of cool too. So what do we do? Well. This, in this particular example, we could actually find where this buffer was by using like a known offset in, the, in memory. So the process starts. You look through memory. You find this pointer that you could identify. And then you walk around trying to find this data structure. You lock it. Then using J and I, you replace it, allocate a bigger data structure, unlock it, and, and keep going. <laughs> it worked. That's a really crazy thing, right? So we were able to ship the app. Um, and you know. Like this wasn't this was I want to be also clear about one thing, which is like this was just to make it so that gingerbread and below worked the same way as later versions of Android. So it wasn't like you know we were only poking a hole. It's like look, we don't want to make this exception for this for, for earlier versions of the OS. I think we all know that the Android ecosystem is super fragmented, and what you can do to make those the same is worth doing. Uh, but you know this is a crazy hack. Like no question that it's a crazy hack and. Another thing that's kind of funny or scary about this is that um, actually there's like three different heuristics that we use to try to find this buffer. 
Um, and for a long time, like the first two have been failing, and we're down to our last one of just like you know, kind of crawling around bite by bite trying to find this buffer. Uh, but it's still working, and then we kind of finally froze our our gingerbread version. I think we're okay. Um, so yeah, I, you know, I want to be clear. I'm not like advocating this. I'm just saying that actually, this is a this turns out to be an effective way to invest your engineering dollars, uh, rather than trying to get people to stop coding or you know to to like. Try to build an architecture that by the time you deliver it, it will almost certainly be not what you need. Um, but in the end, you know, like these, <laughs> these hacks all add up. And you know, they, I don't want to stand here, I think just like Matt, you know, if you work, uh, if you saw Matt's talk about Uber, like if you work in an environment like this, you just kind of get used to everything being a little crazy and broken. Um, so I don't want to stand here and say like, oh yeah, this is great, we're all really happy with this. Uh, but it is, you know, and, and eventually I think these kinds of changes catch up with you. And so back to our conceptual landscape here, um, you know, we've, if maybe when you saw this, you thought the same thing I thought when I first got to Facebook, which is like, this is a great way to find local maxima. But what do you do when you need to find a new hill to climb? Like, eventually you exhaust this and you reach a point where, where you actually really can't change your software anymore. Uh, certainly, you know, one of the projects that I worked on before I managed this product infrastructure group was, was Facebook chat. And we literally got to the point where chat would break when we hadn't even changed anything. Like, we would just, you know what I mean? Like, someone else would write a new JavaScript file and that would break chat for reasons we really couldn't understand. Uh, so at some point, you need this function that takes you somewhere else on this map. And, you know, it may even be somewhere that starts off being not as good as where you were before. In fact, it almost certainly is because you've optimized all kinds of business functions and software around what you've got. Um, and then you need to start this process over of, of climbing up this hill. Um, but this is actually a really dangerous, this is, dangerous isn't the right word. It's a risky activity, let me put it that way. And I, it's because what I, I, describe the, uh, I describe as sharks, the things in production that like are pretty simple. It seems like you could do better with fancy architecture, but they work. You know, and like the shark's been around for whatever, however many million years. Pretty simple design. You know, there's a mouth, and uh, you know, it poops, and then like everything just kind of goes through it, swims around, works pretty well. You know, I mean, I think we're finally going to make these guys extinct, but it's taken a long time. Um, not that that's a good thing. I'm just kidding around. Um, <laughs> but. You know, like these sharks are everywhere in Facebook production. I think like people, I see it all the time. People come to Facebook and they're like, oh my God, this is crazy. How does this, you know, like why are, why are you guys still doing this? And the answer is like, well, you know, it works really well and changing it would be really expensive. So that doesn't mean that we don't try. It just means that like it, it's harder than it looks. And when I think when we do go after these changes, we have to go really deep. And so this is why, you know, product infrastructure is set up to like really rethink kind of fundamental things. And you know, people, yeah, people tease me about, you know, like writing JavaScript libraries all the time. I'm a JavaScripter and I'm proud of it. I'm not even going to apologize for that. Um, <laughs> but uh, but you know, I do think that like you, we can we can have like pretty simple ideas about different ways to do things uh, that can really change that function, that can put us on a different place on that conceptual map. And to do that, you know, I think we need to think really carefully about how we got where we are on the map. And how we got where we are on the map is all about infrastructure. It's all about the conceptual tools and the software tools that were handed like from the moment we start to program. You know, starting with that Unix prompt or starting with a description of the SQL language and, and everything after that. And I want to talk a little bit about infrastructure because um, you know, we use this word infrastructure and it's kind of an analogy. It's kind of it kind of really is infrastructure at this point. Um, this is what I think of when I think of infrastructure. This is a Roman aqueduct in France. It's the Pont de Garde. Uh, and you know, it's a projection of capabilities. Um, this is, did I say aquifer? I meant aqueduct. Um, and you know, its purpose is to take water from one place and, and bring it somewhere else, right? Like from, from a spring to the middle of a city or, or a farm or something like that. Um, it's a projection of capability. But the other thing that I think is really interesting about it is that it's an idea. It's, it's, it's one instance of the generalized idea of being able to have this capability of transporting water around. And there are many Roman aqueducts. Um, and the other thing is, you know, the reason it's an idea is that when the first person laid the first brick for this aqueduct, 
they probably knew that they would not, never see its completion. They were able to project into that future. You know, it's an arrow pointing forward in time. Um, here's, some, here's some infrastructure that you know, is a little more relevant. This is sort of a generic communication satellite. But you know, when we think of like when you text message your friend on the other side of the globe or whatever, you don't really think about this generalized capability we have of beaming communications around, but we all rely on it. And when we build software, we, we sort of expect that capability. Um, now, when we get to software infrastructure, we move into the realm of pure ideas. And actually, you know, this, I think, makes this point better than, than those last two examples do, which is that TCP IP is like one of my favorite examples of software infrastructure. It's been really successful. You know, we would not all be sitting here without this thing. And it's an idea more than it's an implementation, right? There are libraries that implement TCP IP. But the cool thing about it is that you could go sit down and write a new TCP IP stack and you know exactly what to do because it's really well specified and you can hang out and talk to everybody else on the internet. Um, so first and foremost, a piece of infrastructure is a shared idea about how we're going to project capabilities forward um, even when we don't have them yet. And if we take that as the definition of infrastructure, we have to ask, like, well, can you have a bad idea? Can you make a mistake in how you think about this thing? Um, and you know, the answer is really clearly yes. There's all these examples. You know, going back to that Roman aqueduct, it's lined with lead. You know, and, and people, uh, it, it seemed like a good idea at the time, right? Which is like, well, we need to smooth out the water flow. So this is a really good substance for doing that. Um, archaeologists have shown that like, the water coming out of that thing was 100 times uh, more contaminated with lead than the surrounding water. So it was very clearly like poisoning its citizens even as it provided for water. So we can make mistakes with this, and like this will point us in the wrong direction. Then you know people go crazy and they think that like the end of times is coming, or who knows what this did to the Roman Empire. Um, now I'm going to go through a couple examples in software that make me think the end of times is coming. Okay, um, I'm just kidding about that. Uh, okay, first example. Uh, let's talk about SQL. And I'm not going to go on a big no SQL rant. Um, I actually really like SQL. I think it makes a ton of sense. Um, and it's really fun to pretend that like we're mathematicians and we can do like set calculus and stuff. Um, but SQL, the part I want to focus on with SQL is not how we get data out of SQL, but how we think about putting data into SQL. And <clears throat> SQL obviously has insert, got to have that. Um, but it's also got these update and delete routines, right? Like we think of the data in SQL as like just the data. See, the data in our database is locked in time to where we are now. So if we have a record you know, and something changes, we're going to update it. And if we remove that record, we delete it. And this, made, this was fine when everybody was using one computer. But you know, now that's not the case at all anymore, right? So like, you know, this is my SQL replication, but every replication system works like this. You can't, like, there's no meaning to update or delete in a distributed system. All you can do is tell someone, like, hey, you should go update or delete this when you get this message. And in fact, you know, in, in a truly distributed system, we may even update or delete the same record, and we have to kind of reconcile that or have an agreement about what we're going to do about that. So, like, so SQL is a lie. It, it can't happen in a, in a distributed system, which almost everything these days is. Um, now, I'm really happy to see that we're starting to move away from this way of thinking about things. And you know, I think I've seen a, few, a bunch of speakers today talk about uh, Apache Kafka and similar kind of log append stores. And I think this is actually a design that works, right? Like you, if you delete something, you just write down like, okay, Adam deleted this record. And you don't show it to the user, but you remember that like, you know, that's a fact. It can't change. It's immutable. Um, and that matches very well with like the way other good parts of our, our computer systems work. Now, if that's the case, let's go back to SQL for a second, right? So this is actually all fine. Like SQL, my SQL replication works okay. You know, it's not a big deal. If you're Facebook, Definitely causes problems, and you know we need to get away from that. But um, here's where the problem comes, right? Like infrastructure is a is a projection. It's a it's a forward arrow. So we take SQL, which is this concept that people understand, and then we say like, okay, I've got an idea. When you want to talk to a web service, let's kind of mirror that how you do it. Let's let's use HTTP REST, and you can see REST really closely mirrors SQL, and it kind of has the same idea about how we're going to think about resources. We're going to um, not just add them, but we'll be able to delete them and change them. And um, I hope I've made the argument that like, in a distributed system, these things just don't make that much sense. 
they match our, our intuitive notion of how these things might work or how time seems to flow, but it's not really what's happening behind the scenes. And if we give up this, this match, if we take away these um, sort of conceptual underpinnings, we have to ask, like, well, what could we do differently? You know, how should this work? And um, it means that we can kind of cross out this whole thing, right? Like, and people get really mad about this. You know, HTTP REST is the basis of the web, and I, it's been fine. It's it's done fine. You know, I think we never really realized this uh, hate OAS. I think that I'm saying it right. Um, this idea of like a semantic web where you could like kind of literally understand human knowledge by writing a web crawler hasn't quite panned out that way. Um, but you know. It's, I think it's time to let this go. And there, there are a couple of really practical reasons why this doesn't work that well, if you're, especially if you're writing a mobile web client. Number one is that you end up overfetching, right? Because like you've defined a resource as everything we know about this person or this cat picture or whatever. And so you can't avoid just getting that unless you add in a lot of stuff to your REST implementation. The other thing about REST that causes real problems is that there aren't lists in REST. Or there are, but they contain a bunch of URIs which you then need to go back and get each individual item for. And you can work around this, and people will redefine REST so that you can work around these problems. But you know, I'm just sort of talking about like REST as you encounter it in the world, which you know, I think undeniably has problems. And so what you know, we went on this process of kind of figuring out what to do about REST. And for a long time, we just had these custom scripts that mobile apps could call, that our, that our web pages could call. Those proved really hard to maintain. And instead, you know, we sort of converged on the specification for something we call GraphQL. And if you haven't seen GraphQL, it's worth a look. It's a query language over graphs uh, that clients use to specify exactly the data they need. And it can do multiple traversals. You know, that, that's, in a nutshell, that's what it is. Um, I've got a link at the end of this presentation. I encourage you to check it out. As I said, I'm not going to go too deep into these implementations and more just tell you about why they exist. Um, Next example I want to touch on really quickly, which is another idea that we inherit from, you know, from the past. It's a legacy idea that I think we need to re-examine is, is this model view controller architecture. And if you got a chance to see um, Ben and Sam's talk, Rethinking MVC, yesterday, um, they did a better job than I'm going to do of like, kind of laying this thing out. But you know, my take is that like, model view controller was really about like, having a pretty hard to deal with GUI and input device um, rather than you know, having on click, right? So like, if you're reading mouse input from a serial line, yes, definitely let's keep that implementation separate from like, you know, how we're going to deal with the records in our system. Um, but GUIs are much more sophisticated than that now. They work at a pretty high level. This kind of separation causes problems because we're holding state in two separate areas. We've got a model which both gives and takes updates and a view, which both gives and takes updates. And that is the definition of a synchronization problem. And this would be pretty bad, certainly hard to deal with. But what really makes it terrible is when you introduce a high latency server into this equation. And now you not only have synchronization on the client, but you have asynchronous synchronization with the server. Um, and this causes no end of problems. If you've written a big Backbone or Ember app uh, that uses collections, I think you, you, know, you know that you can have this like, proliferation of events that happen when you take an update, especially if you're trying to be optimistic. You know, if, if the user hits delete on the client, you just want to make that thing go away before you hear back from the server that it's really gone. And managing those kinds of updates gets really hairy. Uh, so at Facebook, you know, we sort of looked at this, and we were having this problem. This wasn't theoretical. This was like, hey, we have, we're no longer able to update our ads app because um, you know, it's, it's like too hard to think about what's going to change when we change this event handler. So um, let's not do that. You know, let's just get rid of that and replace it with something much more functional, uh, where updates flow one way through our system. And this is this architecture pattern that we call Flux. And when people, you know, people ask me about React, and they sort of, especially with React Native, people are like, that's crazy. You're going to make your mobile apps better by running JavaScript. Um, I think that's all, you know, that's all, that may be crazy. <laughs> I, we'll see. But uh, I think what we've shown is that this is a good architecture, whether you buy into React and JavaScript or not. This is a good way to design your UI as a functional transformation between your model layer and your view. Um, almost done here. Uh, so, you know, if you're me and like I, I like to get weird, oh, sorry, huh, 
I like, I botched the reveal. Okay, so the, <laughs> I picked two examples of our product infrastructure, these two particular ones, even though they seem really disparate, because they both exemplify something related. And I think this is actually really interesting, which is that you know, uh, the reason why I think we need to question SQL is because there's this log-based stream at the heart of our distributed systems. And the interesting thing to me is that there's a log-based stream at the heart of Flux as well. The, what we've done here is we've used this dispatcher, if you look at the Flux documentation, to choke the updates we take into the system into a single stream of messages. And by doing that, we can make it easier to reason about the state of our application, easier to test. Now, why, why are streams so powerful? Why does that work in these different domains? And I have an answer to this question. This, I promised you would get a little weird. Come with me. We're almost done. Um, and we can have a beer and talk about it. What I think is missing, and what I think product infrastructure at Facebook represents, is a third actor in the system. So I described to you product development, which really comes at things from the point of view of the user and user requirements. And I also described infrastructure, which comes from, things, uh, from the point of view of capabilities and projecting these capabilities forward. But what's missing is the people who make the app. All the people who work on this application and have different concerns and roles. And you know, I think this goes really deep. I think this actually goes down to the bottom of like, how we think and how we understand time. Um, the first person to really ask this question about like, how do I perceive time and how do I react to the world that I see around me was Rene Descartes. Not the first person, actually. Plato and Aristotle did a bunch of this, but I decided not to go back that far. Um, and, and Descartes actually you know, had this idea that like, there's a guy in your brain, like a homunculus, kind of perceiving the stimuli around you and turning that into uh, reality. You know, like that this is your sort of spiritual self that's disconnected from your body. And um, this, this kind of uh, conception is remarkably, like if you think about how you think about who's in here, um, this is a remarkably powerful mental model, even though we can sort of show that it has problems with it, right? Like um, one thing that we know is that the, the senses uh, from your different sense organs arrive in your brain with different delays. And yet we don't perceive these delays, even though they're, they are um, perceptible. And the reason is that we assemble a notion of time that's really coherent, even though that's not actually what's happening. And there's this uh, sort of new uh, theory of consciousness, relatively new. You know, We're talking 80s. Um, there's this very modest book called uh, Consciousness Explained. It's by Daniel Dennett. I really like it. Um, but uh, it doesn't really explain consciousness. But it does, like, I think, advance the state of the art. And one thing that he, um, he talks about is this idea that like, you know, you're kind of constantly revising your notion of what's happening right now. You know, you're projecting a little into the future and revising a little bit in the past to create this like, pretty, you know, it really feels like I'm here talking to all you guys and you're looking at me and stuff like that. Um, who knows what's really happening, though? And if you, <laughs> if you look at this diagram, which is taken like, right out of one of these texts, uh, this is a log-based stream. And I think that's exactly kind of what's happening in our heads. So I think I'm just about out of time. But uh, that's all I've got. Um, I encourage you to check out some of the software we've built. I'd love to share beer with you out there. <laughs>